Here we have all the way from France is Michael Stuart Foley, who's a professor over there of American civilization and bringing the wisdom of this counterculture to Europe, <laughs> to the world. And you try. gave a, you try, thank you. <laughs> you gave a talk yesterday and we're doing some of the through line and connections with the hippie movement, 60s, punk movement, 70s, et cetera. Right. And I have a personal connection to both. And it's this lyric that I hear in a seven second song, clenched fists, black eyes, and he right. says, we're aiming for a different goal, succeeding where the hippies failed. But one thing sure, and you can bet, will be more than a drugged out threat. They were a straight edge band. In your opinion, and what you've observed, read, and studied, were the hippies just a drugged out threat? No. <laughs> <laughs> Good, thanks. <laughs> the hippies were not just a drugged out threat. Yeah. And, I, uh, and that's part of the point of, of the paper I gave yesterday, was to talk about how part of what inspires punks what inspired them as children was the example set by hippie youth and by that generation. Mm -hmm. And then there was a kind of frustration that's built a little bit on caricature on, of, of the hippies kind of failing, giving up, kind of abandoning the cause. And then punks feeling like, right, we have to revitalize this. We have to restart this. So, like one punk I interviewed the other day said, we have to kick the carcass out of the way and then get our thing going, right? But it wasn't like a complete rejection, yeah. right, of like killing the hippies the way you're often told. Right? It, it sounds like just a, a, an accepting of a baton and running with it. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, but, and, and then a lack of willingness to acknowledge that that's what they were doing. Right. That's the strange thing is the total lack of willingness to acknowledge it. Because particularly here in San Francisco, there were a lot of people who were originally punks, uh, sorry, originally hippies who become punks, right? So there's, there's all of these punks are kind of baby boomers, right? And they ra range in age kind of dramatically from people born in the 40s to people born in the early 60s. But the ones who were born in the 40s, they're hippies first, right? And then they become some of the most important intellectuals and architects of the early punk scene. So there's a clear through line from the counterculture to punk. It's just not acknowledged by most of them because most of them were so disgusted, they claim right, with, with the failure of hippies and of that generation, yeah. But it didn't work. Well, if it didn't work, why are you, why are you picking up their baton, right? right? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, in the end, it's both, about, it's, it's in each case about being a kind of rebel culture, right, and, that, and feeling like you get to a certain point where the rebel culture is gone or is absent from the scene and then we're just going to revive it, you know. It didn't look the same, of course, like, so appearance and style was important, but not, uh, not, it wasn't like the determining thing, right? In, in any case, it was all about rebellion. Well, since we can acknowledge, we are two guys who acknowledge the hippies didn't fail, no. they, they, then where do we see their successes today? What were their successes and how are they still influencing our culture? Right, I mean, I'm a historian, so when I teach this stuff, whether it's in France or anywhere else, I talk about all of these uh, kind of protest movements and cultures being part of a very long tradition of American descent so and resistance, right? And so that's, that's a significant part of it, is that it's maintaining this kind of extremely important tradition and culture of descent in a democratic republic that could not thrive, could not be healthy without it, right? And so the important thing about the counterculture and, and the hippies more broadly, the new left more broadly, is that that generation was enormous. And so the influence of that generation as, a, as uh, participants in a rebel culture is kind of disproportionate, right? And continues to carry on today. It's the reason we're here you know, at a conference 50 years later talking about it is because it's an enduring uh, tradition and it was carried on for a long time. And it's still carried on by these people, right? Lots of these people, you know, may have been hippies then, and they may be hippies now, but most of them aren't, but they're still participating in things that are politically engaged, right? Still fighting the good fight. The whole idea that people like abandoned it and went to their hot tubs wrapped in peacock feathers is a kind of caricature, right? That maybe a very tiny proportion of hippies did, but the rest of them carried on doing good work. 
you, you bring up a, a new word concept for me in this context of dissent. What distinction do you draw between dissent and resist, resistance? Well, there's, I mean, they overlap significantly, right? So you can dissent in lots of ways. You can dissent by, you know, through mainstream politics, right, at the ballot box. You can wage kind of political campaigns and things like that. You can dissent uh, in protests and demonstrations and marches and things like that. The resistance, I would suggest, is a kind of uh, broader term for building a kind of culture of resistance, right? A movement, like dissent can happen kind of individually, resist, and resistance can too. You can have individual acts of resistance, but I associate resistance with a kind of a structure of dissent, you know? like a kind of culture of resistance. I, just personally, the idea, the concept of resistance, to me, sounds like fighting against something. It sounds like just a display of a negative reaction and a judgment, to, of, judgment of something and a negative reaction to it. But right. at the same time, it seems to bring attention to something that we're saying we don't want right. to have to face and deal with. Right. So I'm trying to find what's the love version of that. What's the recognition and acceptance that things are the way they are, but yet we choose to be proactive in solutions. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, is dissent, is, does that fall under the blanket of dissent or is dissent more in the realm of the resistance? We, you know, dissent. I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, the terms are close enough. We don't maybe have to distinguish between them that clearly. Um, so is there something on the more positive end of what would be, can we distinguish a, a more proactive, useful word, <laughs> concept for dealing with that which we don't approve of, don't accept, don't right, validate? Right, right. I don't, well, I'm not sure I accept that it's a neg that these are negative terms necessarily, mm -hmm. right? Of course they're oppositional, right? Mm -hmm. They're putting themselves in opposition to policies or, um, you know, to policies and politics that they don't like. And the thing is, is that in, often in the mainstream media and certainly from policymakers and people in power, resistance is often cast as kind of traitorous, right? As treasonous or something like that, right? And that's just ridiculous. Like the thing about resistance in, it depends on the context we're talking about, but in many cases, it's advancing a kind of patriotism, right, a kind of love of America and where America sort of goes off course, right, trying to bring it back onto course, right? So it's, it's competing notions of what's American, what's good about being American, what's um, where and what's, what direction the country should be taking, right? And people in power don't ever accept that, right? Because they don't want dissent, they don't want resistance, they want people to just say, right, what my version of America is the right version. But it's, like I say, it's part of a long, long tradition in the United States that you advance your version of what's better for the country. When I wrote a book about draft resistors, one of the draft resistors said to me, I never felt un-American the way people cast us, right? I felt like I was just having a kind of lovers quarrel with my country, right? Where that had gone astray and we were arguing about it and I wanted to bring it back to the values that it set for itself, right? So that's, that's not negative, right? That's positive. That's like, that's like returning the country and returning the culture to a set of values that it set for itself. Thank you so much, Michael. That was beautiful. Okay, right. <laughs> I want to take advantage of the fact that you are living in Europe, now you're in France, and get that global perspective, that European perspective. You teach about American civilization, about these concepts. What's the reaction of the European students over there? To, like, current events? No, no, no to, to, to what we're talking, to the oh, 60s, yeah. to the counterculture. Well, it's varied, you know? Sure. And I mean, part of it is that students now, for students now, the summer of love, Right, talking about the 1960s is ancient history. It's like, yeah. there's like, very, their only relationship to it is through popular culture. Right? Is it a cool, fascinating thing or a waste of our time? Why are we looking at that? Yeah. No, it is a cool, fascinating thing. Okay. And they're really interested in it. They're really interested in American popular culture, for yeah. one thing, right? They're, that's 
kind of their starting point, and it's often the main reason that they're interested in taking my classes is because they think they're going to learn more about American popular culture. So you attract that. <laughs> yeah, sure. And then the other thing is that they're really interested in the Vietnam War, right? And that's partly also, I think, because of popular culture, because they've seen it in films and on television and things like that. But it's also because they are bewildered by American foreign policy today. They can't understand why the United States under several administrations has done the things that it's done. And so they have a kind of basic sense that all of this weirdness about American foreign policy began with Vietnam, right? Because they can talk to their parents or grandparents who are more celebratory about the United States because of its role in the Second World War and in liberating Europe and things like that. But then it's like, so how do we get from that, from that United States that liberated Europe to put war criminals on trial to a nation that seems to be run by war criminals, right? Like, how did that happen? And so they're often very interested in the Vietnam War for that reason. Like, they have a pretty accurate sense that that's kind of where it turned. And so does that, you feel, give them a, a kindred connection or a, a deeper appreciation for that counterculture and the resistance? And do they absolutely. sort of agree with that resistance? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because, and, and also for their own, you know, in their own culture, um, which has its own dark history of colonialism and things like that and colonial wars and has also, you know, right-wing politicians uh, beating the drums of hate and uh, being scared of refugees, making people feel scared of refugees and things like that. So they, they're interested in the tools or the models that are provided by, say, the counterculture or punks or, you know, more mainstream social movement activism and things like that. Like they're looking for, like most young people that I've encountered in years of university teaching, they're kind of looking for a toolkit right, that they can draw upon to wage their own protests and build their own cultures of resistance. And so for that, you know, I'd like to think as a historian, history is a good place to go. How about the other side of that San Francisco vibe coin, the ideology here uh, of the values of peace and love, compassion, sharing, diggers, free spirit, communal living, um, how uh, psychedelics, yeah. uh, consciousness expansion, et cetera. How do those ideas seem to go over with the current generation over there? Any affinity for those values? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think particularly uh, this kind of culture of openness like we were talking about before, right? A culture of acceptance, of inclusion, of diversity, right? That's something that, you know, in France where I am now, where the, most of the, especially young people, embrace this idea, right? It's, it's, it's older people who are struggling with it. It's not young people, right? Uh, come out of the closet and let us know who you really are so we can accept and embrace and love you anyway. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> no. exactly, right? And, that, the, and uh, you know, thank God for that, you know, that there's young people who are on board with that message because it's the politicians who are so worrying, right? And kind of, cult just as in this country, kind of cultivating this kind of fear. But I don't think most young people, at least the ones I encounter at universities, are not falling for it, right? And they can really relate to it uh, in San Francisco or New York, right? Like when I, when we teach this kind of stuff, it resonates clearly. Well, we hope so. And we hope that we continue to foster and grow this just spirit of, of the hippie free spirit, peace and love, brotherhood, exactly. openness, exactly. Uh, recognizing our inherent connection to all that is and our brotherhood with every man and woman on earth. Exactly. It was the way forward then. And I think it's the way forward now. Beautiful thing. Well, we always love to wrap with a hug. Mark. Okay. All right.